Hey guys, how are we going? Welcome to our first real live uh, live stream and our very first virtual star party in these tough times. Um, hopefully everyone's going really well together. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying being with your families, being with your pets. Uh, my pets know me as the great ball thrower. That's all I do now is throw my pets balls and then they return and uh, I throw them again. <laughs> Um, so, we were planning on having clear skies tonight, but uh, unfortunately it's a little bit uh, cloudy out there and if you go, if people, you're in Perth and have a look outside, there'll be a lot of cloud. There's actually some rain at the moment for us here in, at the observatory, so uh, our mortal enemies have struck again. But don't worry, we did some tests, uh, tests a couple of weeks back just to see how we would do this and uh, we've got some nice images of some fantastic southern objects for you. Um, and the good thing is, is that you get to see objects tonight that would have been affected by, uh, by the full moon, um, which we wouldn't have shown you tonight, but we will tonight. So uh, now that it's, it is cloudy, uh, we'll do one next week as well, next Saturday. Uh, and because there won't be any moon, we'll show some really nice galaxies as well. Um, so yeah, so, We'll get it started, hey? So, um, this is a program we use. It's called Stellarium, and uh, it's very nice, actually. It's a really nice program. It shows you what's up in the sky um, uh, at your time, or in the future, or in the past as well. You, uh, this is, I've got a nice little uh, background of the observatory. So this is the, uh, the viewing area. So we've got the moon up there. Um, and uh, you can do stuff like turn on different stuff like Messier catalogs and the NGC, NGC catalogs to go look at nebulas, star clusters. Uh, so it's pretty. It's a really good tool to have. Um, just trying to get rid of the meteor shells. <laughs> uh, so one thing that was really cool last night that uh, we got to have a look at was if we zoom in a little bit here. You might have noticed, and we just go back a little bit forward, back in time. Oh, too far. <laughs> oh. Where is it? I'm just doing the normal time. Go through here. So last night, we had a pretty cool thing happen with... Uh, Venus right next to the Pleiades cluster right here and uh, we got some really good shots as well one of our volunteers uh, who's an astrophotographer Jeff Scott did a fantastic job and uh, he posted this last uh, this morning after he'd done some work on it so you can actually see the star cluster right here um, Venus is right here as well and uh, that's a it's, it was actually, uh, if you'd had a look through the telescopes or if you had a look through the binoculars, you would have noticed that with Venus, it wasn't actually a full circle. It's a full circle here because there's so much light coming from Venus that it's quite hard to get uh, the, all the stars that you want from the Pleiades cluster and also have the half, cir uh, half um, have the phase. Because Venus is an inner planet, uh, it, it actually has phases just like the moon. And so when you look through your binoculars or through, your, uh, through a telescope, you actually would have seen a half phase. Uh, Venus is coming up and is, about, uh, is coming in the inner lane and going to pass us soon in front of us. And uh, so we're actually seeing it at, at a first quarter phase. Um, this was taken, oh, wrong one. <laughs> this was actually taken, this was APOD, uh, the astronomy picture of the day. Uh, it was... I believe it was yesterday's uh, APOD, or it might have been uh, for America or uh, Thursdays for us. But uh, this was um, this was actually, uh, and you can actually see the difference here. This was uh, Lionel uh, Mazix, sorry for my pronunciation, who took this. And uh, it was obviously taken in the Southern Hemisphere because you can actually see that Venus is down in the bottom down the bottom of the page uh, picture here and not at the top where Jess was last night 
And so you can see it's moved just a little bit um, uh, closer to, uh, to uh, the Pleiades cluster over two days. This, this was actually taken on the fir uh, 1st of April. Uh, this line here, which is pretty cool, that's actually the International Space Station. And that goes right across the page. It goes behind the Discord channel here. And um, yeah, so very lucky shot there. It's always good to be able to get you know, close-up events like this and also get the International Space Station go straight through in the same shot as well. It's, you can kind of see that there's this haziness around the stars and that's because uh, Pleiades cluster is actually going through interstellar gas at the moment uh, in its, as it's orbiting around the, the, uh, the galaxy. So it's, it's, a, it's a really nice uh, star cluster that you can actually see. Uh, as we were talking about with Venus having phases, you can see here, this was uh, taken by Daniel Heron, uh, and he, he did this in between 2016 and 2017, and you can see it going from that, that first quarter phase, or last quarter phase really, to coming around and just to get it in front of us, and uh, when it's straight in front of us, we lose it in the glare. So that this would have been the last real image that he could have shown um, before it, it went into the sun's glare. Uh, Venus is a really... Um, Venus is Earth's twisted sister, really. Um, it's, it's slightly smaller than us uh, at uh, 12,104 uh, 12, kilometres in diameter, where Earth's is 12,742. Uh, 12, so you know, we're talking less than a thousand kilometers in width, but we are a lot more heavier than, than, than Venus. Um, a day on Venus takes 170, uh, 117 Earth days, and it actually rotates the opposite way. That it, ops, uh, it orbits, or it rotates on its axis clockwise, not anti-clockwise. Um, a year on Venus takes 225 Earth days, and so uh, two days is actually longer than a, a year on Venus. Um, it is the hottest planet uh, in the uh, solar system uh, at uh, a whopping 471 uh, uh, Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and it has the atmosphere pressure of about 92 times Earth's. So it's, it's very hot uh, and it's very, it's got a crushing effect on you when you land on the ground. Um, if you ever want to uh, see the best example of, if you first succeed, try, 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 and try, and try, 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 try again. Have a look at, uh, uh, at the Russians, uh, the Soviet program, the Vienna program. They actually sent a whole, I think they got into the teens, late teens of um, satellites to Venus. And uh, the very first one, I think it was Vera 6 or 7, um, that actually landed and safely. And uh, it actually had the lens cap actually melt. Uh, and it was all working fine. They were able to get, you know, uh, test the surface out. But this was going to be the first chance that they were going to actually get a photo of Venus after all these attempts. And uh, the lens cap melted. <laughs> So they sent another one, and uh, it's uh, that actually the lens cap came off, and it fell right on where the uh, the robot uh, the lander's arm was going to actually touch the surface. So they got photos with that one. They just didn't get any samples, uh, rock samples. So it's it's a little bit like the Monty Python Holy Grail. You know, I built a castle and that fell in the swamp. So I built another one, and then I built an, yeah, that one fell in the swamp. I built a third one. And uh, that one fell in the swamp. Oh, that burnt down and then fell at the swamp. And then uh, the uh, the fourth one stayed up. <laughs> um, it's the second brightest object in the night sky. Oh, it's a, it is actually the brightest object in the uh, in the well, second brightest, apart from the moon. Um, that's the moon's the brightest object in the night sky. But it's, and that's why it's called the morning star and the evening star. It doesn't track straight across us like the uh, like other planets from Mars onwards because it's an inner planet it's uh, it kind of does a cone so it goes up in the afternoon uh, in the evening sky 
and then it returns back down towards the sun. And then we wait, a, I think it's about a couple of weeks to a month, and then it reappears in the morning and it does the same thing in the, uh, in the east. It rises and then uh, over a period of time it sets. You can kind of see that curve uh, in the image here uh, with, as he's taken. We've got the, uh, the Pleiades cluster here as well. So this is a really famous uh, star cluster. This is, um, it's, it's called Pleiades because after um, the, the daughters of uh, the Greek Titan um, uh, Atlas who held up the sky. Uh, Z uh, Zeus, when he defeated Kronos or Saturn in the Roman gods, um, and the Roman god for Zeus is Jupiter, uh, when, when Zeus defeated Kronos, uh, and he, Kronos is also a uh, baddie in uh, Star, Stargate SG-1 as well. Um, and that, uh, it's when, they def uh, when they, the, uh, uh, the Olympian gods did battle with the Titans, they, uh, the actual f most feared Titan was actually Atlas, and uh, not Kronos. And uh, when... Kronos had actually defeated uh, earlier on his father uh, Uranus. Um, Uranus was actually the sky god, so there hadn't been a sky god for a while. And so to kill two birds with one stone, uh, Zeus, after defeating the Titans, made, uh, uh, made um, Atlas hold up the sky. And he also, uh, and by doing that, took out a rival, someone that could potentially come back and knock him off from his throne. Uh, and the, uh, so Atlas had these daughters, uh, seven daughters actually, with Pleione, who's uh, an Oceanid nymph. Um, there's a really good book, uh, if, uh, or audio book if you want to get it from, say, Audible, um, that uh, it's called Mythos by Stephen Fry. The actual audio book is done by him as well. So I'm listening to that uh, at the moment. It's really fascinating. A lot of the stories in the Northern Hemisphere are from the Greeks. So you get to learn about the different stories of some of the constellations. Hey guys, how are you going? Um, and uh, so yeah, so it's also actually called Subaru as well in Japan. So if you're driving a Subaru or you've got know someone who's got a Subaru badge car, well, you have a look at that badge. It's got six stars. Well, that's that's the uh, the Pleiades cluster right here, and uh, it's in the constellation Taurus. So it's setting very close to. Uh, it's setting very early in the morning now. You, it's in the middle of uh, Venus at the moment with Venus at the moment. It's, uh, it's 440 light years away from us. So it's among the closest star clusters to, to the Earth. It's also a naked eye object as well. So you can actually use binoculars to, to have a look at this or even just with your, uh, with your naked eye you can. It's, um, it's, it's the be uh, best way to... Um, the best way to actually have a look at it is not through a telescope because it, it's so big. And... Uh, the uh, it's 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 best to do it through the through the uh, through binoculars. All right, Emily. If you uh, Emily, the best way to get there, uh, get to our YouTube page, is to go to our Facebook page or Twitter or even Instagram. We just sent out a, po a post saying we're going live uh, with our stream and that you can. Um, you can grab the link from there. So we're on YouTube at the moment. Uh, so these stars, there's about a thousand of these stars. They're mostly blue uh, hot stars, which you can see here, and uh, they're very luminous. So these are really big stars. They're not going to last very long. Um, only probably about 250, uh, within 250 million years, they'll, some of these will start to actually blow up. Um, and but they'll also disperse in that time as well. Uh, they were formed within the last 100 million years. So they are, in terms of star time, that's really, uh, really uh, cl uh, cl um, close to now. Um, you, the actual, as I said before, the, uh, you can see here in this photo that there's a reflection nebula right here. 
And uh, at first they actually thought it was leftover material from the formation, but uh, they now, astronomers now think that it's unlike uh, unrelated dust cloud that they're just going through. Uh, the simu uh, they actually s have done simulations on what formed the Pleiades, and it was something very similar to the Orion Nebula. So when uh, the, that's the, we'll show you that next. Um, but uh, this is what this is the next uh, stage after a nebula, and uh, there's other stories as well. This is one of the funny things is that once you start to hear all the different stories about uh, the Pleiades cluster, is you start to realise that they're all fairly similar. They all are uh, seven women, seven daughters, seven wives, uh, and or se uh, sisters. Um, so the the thinking is is that this is one of the very first stories that the human civilization actually um, actually uh, came up with. Uh, so in the central desert region of Australia, indigenous people see them as seven sisters who are fleeing the unwelcome attention of a man represented by Orion. And that's, that's the same basic story for the Greeks. They were running away and uh, they pleaded with Zeus to be uh, hid from Orion, who was uh, the most handsome man and the greatest hunter in the night sky, and uh, he he wanted all seven sisters for himself. So Zeus turned them into doves and then put them up into the night sky, and then uh, Orion was put up in the sky for his great deeds, and he put the bull Taurus in in between the Pleiades. And the uh, and Orion to protect them, but they did have to run forever. So I don't know whether you you would consider that being helpful, uh, maybe slightly helpful. Um, also, it's very important to the Maoris as well. Uh, the reappearance of um, Mat uh, Matariki stars in the late May or or early June is a signal for the beginning of the Maori New Year. So it is a, it's, it's a very popular story and, and the, that's pr probably because it's so, uh, it's so prominent. If, uh, you, the way you know you've got some good eyes uh, for yourself, unfortunately I've got glasses, um, is that, uh, is that uh, is it's, you know, if you can see six stars you should be. Uh, you know, you've got some good visions. If you, you can, if you can see eight or nine, um, you probably uh, you, you've got very good eyesight. I usually just see you. Um, sometimes I have to use my peripheral vision, and just that's when I can start seeing the stars. But I can clearly see that there is a, a form of, uh, of uh, mass there in the night sky. Okay, so the next object that we're going to go to is in the Orion Nebula. And um, I'll turn on the, on the drawing here. So one thing, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, one of the things you'll notice is Orion's upside down. And uh, that's because we're looking at from the Perth Observatory and we're in West Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. So everything's upside down <laughs> for us. Uh, but you can see here, um, if we zoom in, we can actually see what we call the asterism here, um, the in the uh, the saucepan. So you can actually see this star here to to where the Orion Nebula is right here in the top right of the Orion's belt, and then we go down to down to the uh, Orion's belt across, and then up to here, and that forms what we call the asterism. Uh, the uh, saucepan. Um, if you want to know where the actual uh, horsehead and flame nebula are, they're, they're just slightly down, uh, just above uh, for us, above the um, actually, just around uh, it's the uh, Orion's belt here. So we can see the flame right here, the horsehead's right here, and then we come up to the lovely Orion nebula. And uh, it's always uh, it's always puts on a good performance. Even if we've been in the middle of Perth doing a uh, uh, offsite events at the old uh, Perth Observatory in West Perth and on Mount Eliza, and we can still get some nebulosity from the Orion Nebula, which is always fantastic. And uh, this is what it, 
I was, oh, actually, well, sorry, we'll go to the moon first. Oh, actually, we'll, we'll, no, we'll go through. There it is. So this is what we took. Sorry. This is what we took uh, last, la, uh, two Fridays ago. So this was using our, um, our Nikon D810A camera here. So we were doing about a 20, I think about 50, yeah, 20 second exposure here. And uh, this, is what, uh, this is what's called a reflection, a reflective and an emissions nebula here. And uh, it's, wh when we say an, a reflective and an emissions nebula, they're two types of nebulas. Reflectives just will have uh, the light from their stars, which we can see here. That, that light will hit the dust and gas and then will come back to us. And that's what we see. Emissions nebulas, that light and the radiation coming off those stars, then actually um, actually uh, heat up the dust and gas. Now, you have to remember, this is they're just a few degrees below uh, uh, absolute freezing, this ga gas and dust. So they don't, um, it doesn't take a lot to heat them up. And so when they do, this gas does slightly heat up a bit, that's when they glow. And so we're actually seeing two types of nebulas. The diff uh, two, there's two other types that we have. There's, um, there's, the, uh, there's planetary nebulas, which are stars like our sun that will go kabang. And we'll show you, we'll probably actually show you one of those um, next week. Uh, called the eight eight burst uh, planetary nebula, and we also have um, one ones called dark nebulas, and actually we'll show you in one of the next photos exactly what they kind of look like. It's uh, the very um, you'll notice in the big uh, here that we have uh, four uh, four stars uh, here, and they're called the trapezium cluster. Now these are massive stars. If you put put them into our solar system. Uh, they would actually extend past Jupiter's orbit, and, or to Jupiter's orbit, really. And there's a lot of radiation coming off them, and they are actually scooping out the nebula. And uh, there's a really good IMAX uh, documentary done by NASA, and I think it was actually vo uh, narrated by Leo uh, DiCaprio. And uh, you actually get to fly in and around the Orion Nebula. So it's a, it's a really good, uh, I think it was, uh, ba it was on Hubble, um, the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, it's 1300, uh, 1,344 light years away from us uh, and it's one of the nearest star forming regions. So you're seeing, when we see this, we're actually seeing this as it was um, 1,344 light years, uh, years ago. It's, you know, where telescopes are really, um, you're looking back in history and uh, unfortunately, Ruth, it's raining here. So uh, we've got some, some, uh, some pre-taken, uh, as they would say, this is what we did before. <laughs> um, and, but there's about 2,000 stars that ma actually make up these, um, make, uh, that have already been made by these, uh, it's this, by this nebula. And it's going to make thousands more. It's still got a, probably another two, 200 million years to go. Uh, it has, it's made up of a mixture of gases and dust. So silicate dust uh, and molecular hydrogen and helium as well. So, uh, and it, it's, while it looks like you could hide a spaceship like they did in um, Star Trek Insurrection, uh, it's very, very diffuse. Even if, you know, when you have a look at it with your own eyes, uh, through a telescope, it looks bluish. Uh, some of young kids can actually see, start to see redness uh, in the in the in the uh, in our big 30-inch telescope. Um, I wish I had as good eyes as they do, uh, but when you and but it doesn't change for us. Even if we were up close, it would still look like that bluish color for us. The reason we we're starting to get some purples and, and reds there is because the camera has had 20 seconds to, to grab the light it can because this is very weak light. It's traveled uh, uh, over a thousand uh, years to get here. So it's very, very weak and uh, you need to capture a lot more light to bring out the actual nebula itself. Um, we've even seen in their block globules. 
So these are named after uh, Dutch American uh, astronomer Bart Bock. And uh, what these are are basically cocoons. So in here, there are baby stars that are being formed uh, every day. Or, uh, well, the, every day and over the years as well. And uh, they're isolated and relatively small dark nebulas. They're, this one is particular, you can see it's lit up on the edges and that's from stars on the edges. Uh, but you can see we, around here that you've got some dark nebulas right here. And that's because there's nothing lighting them up. They're being lit up from the back. Um, they're mostly, so they are, these are contained by molecular hydrogen, which is H2, carbon oxides, helium, and about 1% by mass of silicate uh, dust as well. And they commonly form uh, double stars or uh, even multiple star systems as well. And uh, you can actually see here in this video here as we go through, this is an actual nebula that is actually collapsing on itself. And this is how it, the process of stars uh, formation actually happens. The nebula, its gravity actually pull, starts pulling it in. And you can start seeing, uh, this is done by Matt, uh, Matthew uh, Batt, uh, uh, by, uh, at, from I think it's the Essex uh, University. And you can see the scale down here in the, in the bottom here. This is denoting um, how much dust and gas there is. And we're starting to just to see the first stars forming right now. And they're starting to, and they're now causing more, more uh, interactions and more stars are being pumped out. And guys, if you have any questions and uh, you've got them in uh, and you've, you're in our uh, Discord, please, um, please send them your way and I can answer them as well. And so, yeah, so we're starting to see a, a lot more stars being produced. And we've actually got a multiple star system right here. So this, uh, that gas just dumped a whole lot of stars in, out. And now we're getting expanded view of the and that's, that's how the actual uh, process starts. And uh, we've even seen uh, protostars with Hubble. Uh, and we, uh, we can actually see planetary nebulas as well. So these are all young stars that are just, just started off. And um, you can actually see some of these tadpoles. And these, these are stars that are very close to the trapezium cluster. And all stars have a thing called solar wind. Um, we call it solar wind because um, it, it takes, uh, uh, it's, it, uh, there's radiation uh, and charged particles always flowing off stars like ourselves and uh, our sun. And this, uh, this acts as a wind. It's a constant wind. Uh, and the bigger the star, the stronger these solar winds are. And this solar wind from those tra uh, trapezium cluster stars are actually scooping out the nebula, as I said before. And it's also preventing star formation. So you're seeing with these tadpoles uh, here that they're actually having dust and gas stripped away. So while the star is forming, it might not actually form planets. Um, but you can also see here ones where you've actually got planetary disks. And you can, you can actually see that there are little jets coming off, uh, particularly with this one down here uh, in the bottom, uh, just off from the bottom right, that uh, there's, there's these jets coming off. And that's material that's falling onto the protostar and then being accelerated north and south from, uh, in these jets uh, from the star's magnetic field as well. So it's pretty awesome. It takes... Um, uh, the UN brothers, it takes about two, around about a couple of hundred million years for the actual nebula to, uh, to completely make all the stars it can. Um, the process of it actually, of, this, of the nebula starting to produce stars, uh, there's different things that can happen. In, uh, there is one that we'll show you to, uh, next week called the Tarantula Nebula, and it's in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And um, 
and uh, it's and you can actually see that uh, there is a massive star formation in there, and what's happening is is that the the uh, the large Magellanic cloud is getting very close to the uh, to the Milky Way galaxy, and in uh, as it's getting close, the gravity of our Milky Way is sending grav um, gravity waves through as uh, well, seismic waves through the actual nebula, and that's causing it to coll uh, the collapse and forming stars and. The actual nebula, uh, the tarantula nebula, is actually the, I think, is the biggest, uh, actually the uh, the most active star form uh, forming area in the local gr local group of galaxies. Um, Ruth, if you uh, there is a link here, if you go to the uh, YouTube, our YouTube page, you can see it there. Um, and yeah, so it, it is a really good really good to, um, target to see uh, and uh, it, it always puts on a good show as well um, and we will go back to the moon as well so um, the moon this is a shot that we uh, we took um, uh, that I took actually yes last night and uh, you can actually it's um, it was a first quarter moon and uh, so we should get the full moon within the uh, first uh, couple of days of the week um, of next week, and uh, you can actually see here um, the man, uh, the man on the moon, and uh, in the southern hemisphere, I, I've had to t uh, I've had to tilt on its side to, to make it landscape, but um, you can we actually see it as the rabbit in the uh, in the southern hemisphere, and uh, you can so you've got the the head of the man, the body, the you can see the uh, it's one of the uh, legs of the man and the other leg. Uh, this is the sea of tranquility right here, and uh, so in the southern hemisphere, that's the head of this is the head of the rabbit. Um, the uh, the the uh, the body of the rabbit and the ears of the rabbit as well. Um, over here, we've got this really cool um, crater called uh, Tycho's Crater, and you can actually see these faint lines coming off. And uh, there's even one that goes all the way down through here, and this was a massive impact. You can actually see in the very uh, uh, in the center of the actual crater, there's actually a uh, is it a a little spire there. When this this actually came from an asteroid strike, and when this uh, asteroid struck the moon, the seismic waves went through the moon and uh, converged on the same point as on the other side of the moon. And where the surface is, it actually split the surface up, and there's actually a spire. And that is all just from that impact. And uh, the moon would have run quite, uh, there would have been earth uh, moonquakes, you know, would have really uh, had its bell rung uh, from that impact. But a lot of ejecta went into space, and that then came back onto the moon and fell onto the moon. Um, they, they are called mares, these big, uh, these, what, you know, these seas, and why they thought they were seas was, you know, they were dark patches on the moon, so they thought maybe, you know, we have seas here and oceans on Earth. Well, they uh, maybe they were. We you can see seas on the moon, but what they are actually are massive, big lava pits, and um, and they were uh, they were good places to land for the Apollo missions, as you can we'll see in the next um, image, and uh, because they would be relatively flat. Um, there uh, is it. The good, uh, also the good thing about being just actually slightly after full moon is you can get to see cra uh, craters like Tycho, uh, and there's also one further up which you can see uh, uh, during full moon and last quarter uh, called Copernicus, which is also a really nice one as well. Um, Tycho was actually a candidate, I think, for um, for the later missions that got cancelled, so Apollo 18, 19, and 20 as well. So it would have been a nice one to land and get some uh, 
some samples from there as well. Um, you can in, in the next here we can actually see where the um, where the Apollo um, missions landed. So here, uh, so Apollo 11 actually landed about about here uh, for us. And uh, oh, sorry, wrong one. Oh way. Uh, Apollo 17 also landed there uh, fairly close, just on the other side of the sea. Uh, I think it was the Sea of, uh, I think that's the Sea of S Serenity, I think that one is. Um, Serenity now is Sci yeah, Seinfeld. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, Apollo 17 was uh, one of my favourite missions. I got to meet uh, Gene Cernan before he passed away and definitely ticked off a... Um, uh, one of my uh, on my bucket list there. Um, Apollo 15 was actually a really important mission as well. Uh, that was um, that was a mission that they actually found the Genesis rock, uh, which was an orthosite. Uh, all the rocks that they'd found beforehand um, had been uh, basically basalt, which is just dried up lava, and they were really wanting to see. Uh, try and find the original crust of the moon and to find that they needed to find uh, they were looking for a particular rock called a northosite. Um, there's a really good episode, uh, there's a really good actually series done um, after P Apollo 13 called uh, From the Earth to the Moon. It was done by Ron Howard and uh, Tom Hanks and uh, it's a, I think it's a 12 part series. It's very done in the same, done roughly around the same time as uh, Band of Brothers for Save a Private Ryan. Uh, and it actually talks about um, what they had to do to actually, because they, the, the first couple of missions, they were just pilots. They were there just to dig up rock and that's it. When they started actually canceling missions, that's when the, uh, uh, it was Harrison Smith who was the first non-test pilot who flew on Apollo 17. He actually went and said, look, my old geology teacher, uh, lecturer, could help us. And the later missions were actually, they were taught um, what to look out for as well. So it's, um, it's a really good series. And uh, even I, I've even got, uh, still got the, um, the documentary, the BBC or BBC's documentary called uh, the planets that were done back in 1997, uh, 1999. So I was about 13 when that, uh, but they still have really, the, I think the first episode's about the moon and it's, and uh, it talks about Farouk Albez who, who was one of the geologists and who helped teach the Apollo uh, astronauts as well. Um, they called him the king as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's and also there's a really good documentary that came out um, as a podcast called uh, 13 Minutes to the Moon," and it documents the uh, the 13 minute last 13 minutes to landing on the moon for Apollo 11 and what it took to actually get to that point and make sure that 13 minutes was successful. Um, I think that was about a 10 part uh, podcast series, and it's narrated by Dr. Kevin Fong, who does a fantastic job. And uh, he's just released uh, season two, and it's about the Apollo 13. So uh, I think there's still a couple of episodes to go. So if you have a look um, uh, on iTunes, you'll be able to find it. So it's called 13 Minutes to the Moon. Um, there, how deep are these? Uh, the craters, and uh, Nine Lee, they're they're actually quite deep. Some of these, they're they're some. Um, they're tens of meters to even there's a few hundreds of meters um, deep. Uh, some of the ones in the southern hemisphere, they actually don't um, they don't receive the bottom of the craters don't receive uh, light, and so there's frozen water there. So when they do when the Apollo uh, or when the Artemis uh, astronauts go there, hopefully in the 2024, uh, they'll actually be landing in the southern uh, southern hemisphere because they can try and measure how what how what the water makeup is and whether we could potentially use it for later missions and missions to stay on on the moon as well um so we'll go through we've all gone through here oh and the next one we can see 
we're actually moving now to only as uh, objects that are only viewable in the uh, southern hemisphere. So, in the uh, so we're we're kind of lucky at the moment because we're starting to see the uh, it's the actual uh, we're seeing both arms of the galaxies here. So at the moment, this is the this is the Perseus arm of the of the actual galaxy. And this is the arm where we're looking out of the galaxy. And uh, it's now we're starting to actually see. Uh, and I'll just go so we're actually at today's date. And we're at 10 minutes. And uh, so, yeah, so we can actually see, and I'll turn off the Messier catalogs. You can actually start to see that we have the emu in the sky that we can, uh, that the indigenous people of Australia could see. And uh, this is the Southern Cross right here and the pointers. So this is our closest star right here. This is called Alpha Centauri and we have our beloved Southern Cross. Uh, so Alpha Crucis, Beta Crucis, Delta Crucis, uh, Gamma Crucis, Delta Crucis and Epsilon Crucis right here. The beak of the emu, which we can see here, this is, uh, this is the Colsac Nebula right here. Um, but if we continue just going up, we see this patch of sky right here. And this is called the Carina Nebula. And uh, this is what we can see right here. So this is an image taken by uh, Harold uh, Boren. And uh, this is, this is one, another nebula of our, um, just like the Orion Nebula. It's both a reflective and an emissions nebula. The only thing is that where the Orion Nebula is 24 light years across, this is 460 light years across. And uh, it's over um, 8,000 light years away from us. So when we're seeing light from here, we're seeing it as, um, for, uh, you know, we're seeing it over 8,000 years ago, it's left. And we can actually see here, this is, uh, this is the dark nebula here called the Keyhole Nebula. And you know, you've got to remember, that this, is not, this is not just a, a 2D image or a 1D image. This is, this is a 3D image. So the key, uh, the the key, uh, it's the key, uh, keyhole nebula is actually in front, and uh, we're seeing dust and gas lit up in the back here. Um, this is what we took. This is what we took uh, two Fridays ago, and so you can actually see here this star right here. This is called Eta Carina, and uh, it's a st very very um, interesting star because it's a star that's about to blow up and astronomically speaking when we uh, when we talk about it astronomically speaking it could blow up today it could blow up tomorrow and then we've got to wait you know, about 70 uh, 75 to 8,000 years or it could blow up in a million years or it could have even blown up and we're just waiting for the light to get here uh, it's a massive star it's, a, it's what's called a hypergiant star uh, it's also circ circumpolar, so when it does blow up in a supernova, uh, it will actually be a viewable th um, in the daylight, and because it's circumpolar, it will be viewable during the um, during the daylight, and here in Perth, uh, and it will be viewable at night, and it will be viewable during the day uh, for a, for a good couple of months, really. Uh, these things actually outshine their own galaxy. So when it does blow up, it'll actually outshine the Milky Way galaxy. So if you're, if there's another alien species in another galaxy looking at our galaxy, you'll actually notice a uh, a big bright dot uh, in our galaxy where you uh, where Eta Carina is. Uh, if you actually place Eta Carina in the middle of our solar system, it would reach to Jupiter. It actually has a sibling as well, uh, and it's in a highly elliptical orbit and it takes about 5.5 uh, 5 years to orbit around the main star. Uh, it's very, very bright. It's 400 uh, million times uh, uh, brighter than our sun. So you would definitely need uh, 50 plus 
uh, sunscreen if you ever need to go outside uh, and you would also de uh, definitely need to be wearing sunglasses if you go outside as well. Um, you might also want to wear a hat, as a, a wide brim hat as they say and long sleeve shirts. Um, but what was really fascinating, you know, if that wasn't just fascinating, was that it nearly uh, went supernova back in 1843. Uh, it had what's called a supernova imposter event, where it ejected a huge amount of its mass in one event. And in a few weeks, um, Eta Carina went from a star of, I think it was about magnitude 8, to about um, the second brightest star. And uh, we can actually see that, uh, see the result of that nebula, uh, that explosion, in this image right here. So this is one of the what's called the homunculus nebula, and uh, you can actually see there that are there a bipolar cloud, uh, clouds being of ejected matter, coming off the star itself, and uh, we can actually see that even closer with this next image here. So you can actually see that these this is material that actually came off the star. Now you can see the nebula, the Carina nebula at night, but you can't see the uh, um, the Eta Carina star with the naked eye. You do need a telescope or uh, to see it, um, and that's uh, yeah, that in in the end that could possibly come back again if it has another major moment. Um, the actual entire nebula would have looked very different uh, before the great eruption of the uh, 19, uh, 1843 and that was because uh, Carina, uh, the Eta Carina would have actually been uh, surrounded by dust and gas and would have been reduced, uh, the, the light coming from it would have been reduced in escaping the actual nebula as well. Uh, so We've got another little one called an, uh, another op, uh, open star cluster. And this one's a little bit further down. And this is right near, so if we go back out here, so we're looking in the south, and you can see just below uh, Beta Crucis, we have the jewel box right here. And this is a really cool object that we I like to show on our night sky tours, um, and uh, this is the shot we took uh, two Fridays ago. It's just it's really nice. It, it's show it's um, you can actually see through the telescopes the different colours of the stars. It's an open. Uh, it's called the uh, Jewel Box um, from John Herschel's own description of it. Um, in, in his writings about the jewel box, he said, this cluster, though near or neither a large nor rich one, uh, is yet an extremely brilliant and beautiful object when viewed through an instrument of significant aperture to view distinctively the very different colors of its constitutional uh, constitu stars uh, and um, constituent stars, sorry which gave it the effect of a superb piece of fine, fancy jewellery. And so that's where we get the name, the Jewel Box, from. Uh, it's, uh, it's considered, it is regarded one of the finest objects in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it's actually about 6,400 uh, 6, light years away from us. And uh, so when you, again, you, when you're looking at this, you're looking at it as it was 6,400 years ago. And you know, if there was a plan, uh, they're, they're very young stars. They're um, they're only about 14 to 16 million years old. Uh, so think toddlers for stars. Um, it contains about a hundred stars, and uh, it's about 14 light years in diameter. So from one side to the other side, you know, you're talking about. A, uh, light traveling just 14 years to get across to the other side. Um, the three in the middle that you can see here, this is called, unofficially called the traffic lights. So we have orange, blue, and white here. Um, it's actually quite difficult to uh, determine the distance of this, uh, of this cluster because it's so close to the Colsec uh, Nebula 
or the head of the emu, it obscures some of the light. So it, it did take a lot to actually um, to work out how far away this was. Thanks, CBD. <laughs> so, an, the final object for tonight. We're gonna... Now we've seen open clusters, there's another type of type of uh, star cluster. It's called a globular cluster. Now, if, if open clusters were considered pr uh, kindergarten primary school for stars, uh, think of globular clusters as active, uh, star, um, active retirement villages. Uh, they're, they're very, very old stars. Uh, and these were formed at the beginning of our galaxy, around the same time as our galaxy. And they are massive, massive things. So this is Omega Centauri. We're lucky in the Southern Hemisphere that we actually have the um, three biggest uh, um, globular clusters in the, uh, in, around the Milky Way. We have Omega Centauri, uh, then we have 47 Tuck, which we usually show in spring and summer. It's, I actually personally like uh, 47 Takana better because it's, while you, it's reduced amount of stars, it's more n nice and neat and structured where Omega Centauri can get a, uh, it doesn't look as neat. Um, but this is the shot that we took two Fridays ago. Now remember, this is just a test image, so we could have done a better job and we will <laughs> for the other live streams. But this is, this is what we, uh, this is what's about 10 million stars you can see here. Um, I wouldn't count because it will take forever, <laughs> uh, but um, there, there's about 150 of these uh, globular clusters are, uh, in the Milky Way. They exist above and below the disk of the, the, of the actual galaxy. Um, this one is, is about nearly 16,000 light years away from us. Uh, it, it is the largest at around 150 light years across. It actually it spans across in our night sky one and a half times the size of the full moon. So it's actually bigger uh, in the uh, and it's you know if you go out to the country or we can even see it here with the naked eye. It just looks like a fuzzy dot, but it's the second largest that we've ever seen. Uh, there's Merrill two that orbits around the Andromeda galaxy. That's uh, 250 light years across and has about 20 million stars. They estimate that uh, this, that this uh, it's globular cluster has about 10 million stars uh, and they're roughly around about 12 billion years old. And so you know, they're coming towards the end of their life. Um, the stars in the center here, uh, they are, you know, they, they're very close together. They're about 1% of the light year away from each other. You know, when you go out and have a look at the Southern Cross and you find the two pointers, the bottom star and the pointers, uh, that's actually, uh, that's our Centauri system. That's our, the closest star system to our sun. And that is four point, just over 4.3 light years away from us. And so to put that into perspective, if, our, uh, if the Alpha Centauri uh, stars and the sun were tennis balls, if the tennis ball was here, uh, if our sun was in Perth in the CBD, the tennis ball that would rep uh, the two tennis balls that would represent Alpha Centauri A and B, and you know obviously you'd have probably have golf ball size for Proxima Centauri that orbits around it, they would actually be in about X mouth. That's how big space is, uh, in uh, how big our galaxy is, and that's another reason why when people say. Oh, when you get galaxy mergers, do you actually get stars colliding? Well, considering how many galaxies there are, there, are, there probably would have been one or two mer uh, galaxy, uh, stars hit each other. But when the Andromeda galaxy and our, uh, and our galaxy merge, there won't be any uh, gal galactic collisions uh, between stars. Um, it will take a long period of time as well. So. If stars do get close to us, we'll actually they'll actually gravitationally affect each other. Um, so 
uh, it will be a pretty interesting time if we can, uh, if we live, if you plan to live forever. Um, uh, so in the outer areas here, they can actually, uh, it's still quite close uh, to them. The stars can be about a light year away from each other. We haven't actually seen, um, there's only one galaxy, as a one globular cluster that we've found exoplanets uh, in. And uh, it, there's, um, that was M4. Uh, I think M4's in the, in the Scorpius constellation. Um, but if you did actually have a, pl uh, a planet in the s around in the center stars, um, there wouldn't be any night time. Um, where you'd, at best, you'd get conditions like d uh, dusk or dawn because you'd have so many stars so close to each other that you'd get a lot of light still, even though they were worth 10% of a light year away from each other. Um, there is some thought that May Centauri might actually be uh, slightly different from other gla uh, galactical uh, globular clusters and um, that uh, and that it might have actually been a dwarf galaxy that had been gobbled up by our galaxy uh, so galaxies have this uh, ten, uh, cannibals to survive and grow they eat other galaxies and uh, so there has been some thought that maybe Omega Centauri was a small dwarf galaxy that got, uh, that went through our galaxy, had a lot of the stars and gas stripped away and left over by, uh, you had the just the core of that, gal um, that dwarf galaxy stay together. Um, there has been, uh, they do know that there could be a black hole there. Measurements from Hubble of uh, the star movements in the centre uh, have revealed that there is a dark mass that's quite heavy, which would possibly be a uh, black hole um, but the, the, you know it, it's it would be really interesting normally they uh, normally uh, um, globular clusters are uh, just made from clouds that exist above and below the actual forming disk of the galaxy um, they are used you I would say that most of these stars are what are called gen 2 stars um, and these these are stars that uh, have formed from the generation one, uh, generation three stars, which is the very first stars. Generation three stars were just basically hydrogen and helium behemoths that lasted only you know hundreds of thousands to millions of years because they just were so big. They ran through uh, they ran through their fuel so much. Um, generation two stars, they when you when you actually have an supernova um, you actually get elements uh, uh, as the star is dying you start to see stuff like carbon oxygen nitrogen um, carbon start to form in the in the actual core and when the actual core starts to develop uh, fuse calcium into iron that's when the actual process of the star collapses because the star is working on a premise of being explosive nature wanting to escape but its own gravity holding it in and iron just takes too much energy to, uh, to fuse it uh, fuse iron and so the star loses that battle collapses and then rebounds and for the really big stars you get these things called supernovas with our Sun what will happen is the core will collapse uh, there'll be a sl uh, and the outer layers will go off and you'll get this nice planetary nebula. Uh, so generation two stars have a little bit of met what we call metallicity. So astronomers, anything that's not hydrogen and helium is considered a metal. Even if it's not a gas, it's called a, uh, a uh, metal. So our stars are generation one stars, so the third generation, they've got a lot more um, metals in it. So when you ha do a spectrum of our sun, you'll notice that there is carbon, there is oxygen, in the star, um, uh, in some amounts, but uh, these, uh, and that's the way we can actually determine how, uh, what type is the, of these stars are they generation one, generation two? We get to see generation three, but some of these new telescopes, like um, uh, the James Webb Telescope, if it ever gets up, um, and if it actually ever unfolds uh, <laughs> when it's in space. Um, we could possibly see those stars. It, it, you just need to have a massive big 
uh, telescope. Even some of these telescopes, like the extremely uh, extremely large telescope and the 30 meter telescope that they're building in uh, um, in Hawaii, the extremely large ones in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and they are uh, they're going to be massive, big telescopes, which we could possibly see that far into the, uh, into the history of the universe as well. Um, yeah, so uh, the UN brothers, out in about 4.5 billion years, uh, our galaxy, it, it, won't, it won't technically be eaten. They like to call it a merger, uh, but the Andromeda galaxy is, a, is about twice the size of our galaxy. So while they like to call it a merger, it's more of like a hostile takeover or being eaten. So... Yeah, into your question, I would say it's more about uh, it will take about yeah, around about 4.5 billion years, uh, but the process of actually coming together will take another couple of billion years. So by about eight billion years, I think it's all settled, and we'll, we won't have a nice classical spiral. What will uh, will actually happen is, as the galaxies are merging, they'll uh, they'll uh, they'll have a big star burst because there's all this dust and gas coming around and meeting each and colliding and uh, you'll get a, an elliptical galaxy so it'll look like a ball and uh, that's basically the that's the beginning of the end of our galaxy uh, the dust and gas will be used and uh, will will uh, will be started to be used there won't be any replenishments and um, they'll really the, if any other galaxies come in and get uh, come in it's just in um, extending the inevitable um, one of the interesting things before we finish up tonight uh, the, is that this is, this is another object that has been seen for quite a long time and we've got records from uh, Ptolemy, uh, the Greco-Roman writer and astronomer Ptolemy um, that he actually catalogued Omega Centauri as a star uh, in his Almagest in uh, 150 AD uh, in uh, there was in uh, 1603, uh, German uh, lawyer and cartographer Johann Bayer, uh, Bayer um, actually d also uh, d actually gave it its name, Omega Centauri, and uh, also designated it a star. But it was actually uh, it's Edmund Haley who actually rediscovered it, um, and actually. For, was the first person to designate it as a non-stellar object. Uh, the first actual time it's called a globular cluster is by Scottish astronomer uh, James Dunlop in 1822 when he actually was doing his observations at the observatory in Parramatta and in New South Wales here in Australia. And he, was, uh, he described it as a beautiful globe of stars, very gradually and moderately compressed to uh, to the center, so it's um it's really it's a really nice target, and um, you know it's 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 a good one to end on. But before before we um before we finish, I'll it would be amiss of me to uh, to not tell you how we find our bearings in the southern sky. Um, so in the northern hemisphere, they're very lucky; they get to see. The, uh, they get to see uh, Polaris, which is the northern uh, northern star, and uh, so uh, even when we set up telescopes, the page the page will always be like one one step or two steps for for the northern hemisphere. Just basically turn it on, get to this point, find Polaris, press enter. With the southern hemisphere, we have to do a little bit extra work for that, um, but uh, we can see uh, so we might not that this one right here this is our south celestial pole right here now what we do in the southern hemisphere is we find the two pointers the two, middle of the two pointers right here and then we draw a line through there straight line and then we draw a line through the through the cross as well and where those two lines intersect is the South Celestial Pole right here, and uh, it's that, and that's really it. That's how you, you can get your bearings. Then you know that if you uh, if you're looking south, 
and with if you point out your right uh, your right arm, then you're looking west. If you point out your left arm, that's you, uh, you're looking east, and directly behind you is south. And uh, also, if you find a river stream, Bear Grylls says to follow it downstream, and because usually civilizations downstream. So that's um, if you're ever lost in the southern hemisphere, um, look for the Southern Cross, and uh, you can get your bearings and uh, make sure, and and you can start trying to make it uh, back to civilization. So. If, Thanks very much, guys, for, for joining the t um, this live stream. We'll be doing it again next Saturday, and it might look a little bit different because I'll be in the dark, So, and we'll be uh, using the telescope and camera and uh, computer. So you probably uh, I'll try and put a red light on me so you can still see, see me. Um, just before we go, I'd like to thank very much our facilities coordinator, Ken, who uh, we've had some internet issues um, and we don't know if it's just because everyone's working from home or if uh, it just happens to be something on site but uh, our phone lines are terrible at the moment so we've got uh, you might have seen at the very beginning of um, of the uh, it's of the stream this image here this is our Lowell telescope so this is the main research telescope um, telescope of the uh, of the observatory and up there is a 4G router and that is now actually as uh, it's up there is a uh, that router is getting receiving 4G from a, uh, one of the radio towers here and uh, that was a quick fix to get, at least get us enough bits uh, or enough upload speed to be able to do this um, and also I you know would really like to thank Another person, uh, Fraser, came from Universe Today. Who um, he he did the uh, he did these virtual star parties when I back around about 2012, and I would actually have this set up during while I was working, and um, he would. Uh, so I've always wanted to do one of these since then, and I got to uh, to meet him on a cruise um, in 2018, and I got to have a chat with him and and. Uh, he was more than willing to ha give me as much knowledge as possible. So, a lot of this and the streaming that we did for um, for timeanddate.com in the last couple of lunar eclipses and partial lunar eclipses, you know, this has all been help from him. So, and and also uh, just knowing what to do. So, um, before you go, if you want to uh, follow us, you can follow us on uh, Facebook. Uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram the links are down in the descriptions here um, also like I love this I'm gonna say this uh, all these uh, podcasts uh, the uh, video streamers that I listen to if you can like the page and subscribe to us that would be fantastic if you want to uh, even donate to the observatory uh, you can uh, we've got a patreon account as well now um, the observatory is run by the volunteer group that was set up in 96 to help run the night sky tours and uh, since 2015 it's been uh, the volunteer group running the uh, observatory for the um, for the government and uh, department and um, you know we've, we've got some we've started even doing research again uh, which is fantastic so um, th uh, so it, the future does look really good but thank you very much guys for uh, for uh, being uh, watching me and I hope you found the information really uh, a lot and uh, really uh, if you like the information and um, we'll see you next next Saturday we'll see you later bye